Welcome everybody to a brand new episode of the Jams and Tea Podcast Record Club, where we talk about a recommended album by one person at this podcast every single week. And today we are going to be talking about the most recent full-length album, which is weird considering it's less than a half an hour, uh, from a one Mr. Earl Sweatshirt's Some Rap Songs. It is my recommended record and to be honest, I think the, only, the the main reason I wanted to do this album was A, it's a fascinating album just in and of itself, and B, we don't cover nearly enough hip hop on these segments, and I just kind of wanted to. And also, it's, you know, sometimes if we have long albums uh, um, up on the docket, it helps if you include something that's a bit more brief. But mm-hmm. to set the stage a little bit here, Earl Sweatshirt, um, Basically, a uh, member of the future, the future, the odd future collective uh, that featured many different artists who are now insanely big at like the beginning of the 2010s. I know a bunch of my high school experience was seeing the rise and take off of odd future via their like mixtapes or just sort of Frank Ocean's general popularity, Tyler, um, also home to people like uh, Domo Genesis. Uh, but I think sort of the three people who really came out of Odd Future were Frank Ocean, Tyler the Creator, and Earl Sweatshirt. They were sort of the the vanguards, the the solid foundation that they were built upon. And their solo careers have gone in really divergent and very interesting ways. They were just kind of a collective that very f- much focused on sort of the homegrown um nature of uh hip hop that's just sort of the general direction it was moving in so they kind of became a lot of uh shapers for what was to come in the world of popular music in a lot of senses but i think it's basically undeniable at this point that their individual solo careers are at least like taken on their own much better than the work they did in odd future and just sort of allowed them to jump off from that and earl in my opinion of the three artists might be the most generally consistent one, even though I do think all of them are great and enjoy work from all of them immensely. But Earl has always been a very unique voice, a voice that started out with his uh, first album, which I think is just called Earl uh, from back in sort of the odd future days. And then he released uh, Doris, which got a decent amount of acclaim, but it didn't really um, sort of show off his I think the entire breadth and scope of his talent until his album, I Don't Like Shit, I Don't Go Outside, which is a record that definitely takes a little bit to hit properly, in my opinion. But once going back to that album, it is a genuinely devastating, oppressive record that revels in true, genuine emotional darkness and is also a flawless showcase for Earl's talent as a beatsmith, as a producer, uh, the way he mixes, just everything about these guys and how they're basically just just so immensely talented for what they want to do. And I think Earl sort of uh, coming into his own with that album is uh, very much indicative of him as an artist overall. And afterwards, things get a little bit muddy, um, mainly because Earl has at least aside from this record and the EP Feet of Clay that followed it, uh, he's mainly been a feature on lots of different artists, um, but mainly because um, he suffered a bit of a spell where he had always been open about his struggles with both anxiety and depression. He had to cancel a tour eventually at one point and sort of out of this very uh, dark time in his life came Uh, some musical projects, uh, some rap songs uh, being a little bit more forward. But I think at the beginning of what I think this sort of phase in his career was started with an EP called Solace, uh, which I don't know how many people have heard that. I think Tyler shared it. Um, But that EP, I think if for anybody who's heard it, at least, I think we can agree is pretty fucking fantastic, honestly. Um, It's 10 minutes. It showcases how great Earl is at doing his murky, grimy, lo-fi thing, but also his, like, the lyrics on that for, you know, it's a lot of it's instrumental, but a lot of it, too, is just genuinely so very, like, alarming to the point where if you listen to it, you kind of worry for how his general, like, condition is. And then you even hear some points of the production on this album that are used later on some rap songs. Specifically, that very beginning is incorporated into one of the beats on here. But some rap songs come out of the blue. It has a weird-ass fucking cover. 
it's about you know 20 something minutes 24 minutes and yeah and it's got a lot of songs sort of came out that year where a lot of short albums hip-hop albums specifically were coming out and it's generally agreed to be at least one of his better projects if not his best but i think the interest lies in just how niche of a product it ends up being because if you listen to something that's very like accessible in terms of hip-hop in the 2010s this is so far removed from that that I think you could hand this to somebody who loves like, you know, somebody listens to people like Kedrick and Loopy Fiasco and uh, like, or even something earlier like Outkast and give this to them and they'd be like, what the fuck is this shit? So I am somebody who really liked it when it came out, but gradually I've come to listen to it more and more. It kind of fills in the gaps. Um, it's definitely something that stayed with me and I, I, I love it a lot. I think it's one of my favorite hip hop albums at this point um, for various reasons I might get into, but I really want to know what you all have to think about it just because it's definitely an album that I think will at least provoke an interesting reaction out of you all, even if I don't know or necessarily think that you'll all love it or even like it. So go well, ahead. What, what is interesting about this, just to build on what you were saying. So I'm glad you brought up solace so i don't have to solace was released closer to the time of the of the record that precedes this one i don't like shit i don't go outside yeah. which i think is a very interesting record and very much a turning point in earl's career um that i think uh is a really special record it is maybe the most nihilistic hip-hop record i've ever heard in my life it is <laughs> oppressively dark it is very short as well it's, it's longer than this one but it, it has that sort of sense of conciseness that um is meaningful coming from Earl, I think. Earl expresses in a way that's very, it comes across as very stream of consciousness, but I presume is, is very cleverly orchestrated because he writes in a very layered and impressive way. Like he, his wordplay is astounding. He's a very, very talented writer, um, but he, he writes and performs, or at least he performs in a way where it feels like he is unspooling his thoughts and you're kind of swimming through them and then as soon as he's done expressing an idea he moves on and it's almost as though he can't bear to spend uh too much time within a particular mode or within a particular place lest he become stuck in it i mean that's why solace is as as dark i mean solace is, is probably the most hopeless thing he's ever put out it is this yeah it is a single 10 minute track but it, the beat switches it's got like six or seven beat switches in it it moves through these different kind of sections some of which he he's rapping over some of which he isn't and it feels very much like you are in many ways the musical comparison for the solace <laughs> that is the closest to me is like the latter stages of the caretakers everywhere at the end of time uh -huh. it has like a sense of of uh vacant doom to it um and mm -hmm. so some rap songs coming in the wake of that era and and particularly as you said uh, including samples of solace and building on that template is interesting because it is i mean on the face of it it's it's a less dark it's a less oppressive record than i don't like shit it's a more dynamic and musically varied record it is obviously a shorter record it is a more concise record but it has this ramshackle feel to it that feels like the logical progression from the previous <laughs> record and EP that precedes it. It's almost as if Earl's career, his progression so far is really fascinating to me, especially when you compare it to those other artists, like just hip hop generally, but even if you just want to compare it to the other artists you've already mentioned, like Frank Ocean, for instance, who isn't really even in hip hop anymore. He's more of a R&B performer. And um, Tyler, the creator, for instance, um, these artists, who have kind of gradually grown more and more ambitious and varied and multifaceted with each release that they put out. Whereas Earl's progression has been interesting. He's managed to have the same sort of sense of artistic widening, but yet while his progression is kind of being the inverse, he, because uh, I mean, the most colorful and varied and dynamic record he's put out is Doris, I think. Yep, I um, agree. And, 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 and since then he has gotten kind of his records have gotten less conventionally structured, more yeah. ramshackle, more kind of pieced together. And yet 
and this is something that has taken me a while to kind of fully get, I think, because I never really understood Earl until I really spent time with his music more recently. Um, this quality that his music has, that some rap song beautifully encapsulates, the sense of kind of disconnection, of jarringly moving from a, one thought, one idea to <coughs> another, um, it's very much... It feels very much like the logical end point of this progression that he's moving, then moving on from record to record. It is the most extreme example of the style he's been perfecting. Um, the production is, is sensational, most of it handled by Earl himself, which I think is something that's not appreciated enough about Earl. Like obviously, the people who are super Earl fans will, will wax lyrical about what a great producer he is. But generally speaking, when he comes up in culture, people are talking about his incredible uh, wordsmith and abilities and stuff, which rightfully so, but his production ability is not to be undersold either. It's, it's, it's integral to uh, the way that the record, his records work or don't work, is on his ability to complement his delivery, which is, it's kind of like, I want to describe it as sleepy, but not like in a way where it sounds like, you know, he's falling asleep or that he's going to lose your attention or anything. It's like he's kind of, it's more, I guess, just depressive and like it, it sounds and emotionless in certain ways. Although there are points at which he does become more animated. He has this delivery where it feels like he's stumbling through his lines from line to line, but he also has this flow that keeps you locked into it. It's a really interesting uh, style that he has because if it were anyone who doesn't have doesn't have the ability to to um, flow and and rap the way that he does this kind of style that he has would completely fall flat but he just keeps you gripped and hanging on his every word he has a great way of enunciating words and lines so that they feel like they're cutting um, and he he's just his delivery is fantastic in that regard and. I, I want to step back for a minute because, I mean, for all I know, everyone here might love the way that this record is pieced together and structured, but I mean, there might be some people who don't care for that. And so I want to hear from the perspectives of, of Morgan and August, and then maybe yeah. we can have a discussion about why this record is the way that it is um, and what that says, I guess, about what Earl is trying to do and yeah. whether you think that works or not. I liked this album a fair bit. I also f find it rather frustrating. I just want m more and I want it to be more developed. And the fact that it doesn't frequently frustrates me. Um, I guess just in terms of uh, purely from a structural perspective, without talking about anything else, I am not a terrible fan of this album. I, I have like, and it kind of, it's hits me in a very similar way to the backwash album we covered where I, I just don't find myself getting terribly invested in a lot of the songs here. I find the, the scant run times really feel like they, they pull me out of it. And I, I've tried listening to this album almost as one big cohesive piece, which I almost I almost think is the way it's intended to be experienced. I, I would say absolutely it is the way oh, that yeah. you yeah. approach it. Yeah, for sure. Not <coughs> not as like individual tracks, but as this kind of big kaleidoscope on depression. And in that regard, I I kind of in I, I enjoy it more, but it it is that struggle for me of getting into the mindset where I'm really listening to this as like a 24 minute song and rather rather than 15 like one and a half minute songs. Mm -hmm. And I find that mindset a bit difficult to overcome because I think, I and I think it would be easier for me to overcome if maybe the transitions between these songs were a little sharper I think like the beats had something a little had a bit more of a through line between them I feel that would have dramatically increased how invested I am in it mm. and, and that's 
that's just from a construction of a of an album perspective i that's not how that's not indicative of my feelings lyrically about this album which i'm sure we'll get into one thing i'll say in defense of the the structure in terms of that uh songs just kind of ending and then you're into the next song is that for me why why i like that as opposed to why I would normally agree with you and, and you would like to have some sense of, of consistent flow, but why I like the stilted nature of the way that these songs are kind of produced and edited and, and, and pieced together next to each other is that to me, it kind of has the feel of coming in and out of, coming in and out of like a state of stupor, like where mm -hmm. you are suddenly incredibly aware of, of what's happening in your life and then you just kind of black out and you're suddenly some time has passed that you were completely unaware of and you and there is now a different day or it's now you're in a different place and that sense of unfixedness of, of kind of being uh <laughs> not tethered to the world that you're living in being kind of out of step with it is a beautiful um depiction of Errol's depression I think and as a way of approaching that in terms of musical construction that um yeah, could easily fall on its flat face for sure. And, and perhaps as a, as a cooler idea and concept than an ex execution. But for me, I think it really does work. And it, it works because it's so, again, the lyrically Earl's, you know, as great as he ever is here, but also he has a particular writing style here where he is, the things he's rapping about, like the songs themselves, don't really have any kind of sense of fixed start point, end point. Um, he kind of just starts rapping and eventually he kind of just stops rapping. I mean, there's one track where he just repeats the same eight bars over and over and over again. Um, and I didn't even realize that the first time I heard it because I was so lost in the way it was sounding. I think it's the second track on this record. Yeah. That he does yeah. That. yeah. Where, so there's a, a sense in the way that he's performing uh, as well as some of the subject matter of the things that he talks about as well, where you do get the sense of his state of mind and in many ways, it is disarming and, and, and it's kind of uh, uncomfortable in a way that I think it, he intends for it to be and in a way that I think works in terms of the listening experience for me at least anyway, um, but also is inherently on paper a thing that shouldn't work. Uh, and I, I guess I suppose I can't really explain more than that why I think it does work. It certainly will say that when I first listened to this record when it came out, I felt similarly. I just, I couldn't, I didn't really appreciate what I was going for. And I did kind of just want a lot of these beats to kind of last for longer and, and for there to be a more kind of sense of, of fleshed outness to the songs here. But I think in terms of what Earl is trying to evoke in terms of a sense of dissociation and a sense of kind of just life happening to you and you being unable to kind of reach up through the fog of it for, for any longer than just a few minutes at most is quite a powerful um, thing that he conveys and um and also like i said feels like uh the next evolution or the next step in the evolution or devolution of his sound where he's kind of getting more and more fractured and more and more concise and brief and less fully formed with each album which is a curious thing to do as an artist to progress in a way that's kind of like where you're instead of building on each record in terms of making going bigger and bigger earl is kind of um regressing more and more inward uh structurally but it ends up working for the things that he is trying to convey in my opinion anyway i think that you the the way you sort of talk about how it creates that effect of like reaching through the fog i've once referred to this album as like watching a an old television that is picking up radio static from hell and that's basically the mood and the vibe here for me. And that's why I think it works uh, for every reason that you said it works for me as well. And I like, again, I can't begrudge anybody for feeling like the, either the runtime or the structure lack thereof is what holds them at odds. Because in many respects, I, A, um, probably felt a little bit of that uh, initially. And B, I, just with this, what this album is even trying to do. I just sort of feel like that's an inherent thing of this is a classic case of feature or a bug. And it just sort of depends on whether or not you land on either one, really. And yeah, I, I think there's no real denial in that uh, Earl is both careful and like a, a very good craftsman. Um, 
even if it's not traditional or even necessarily like enjoyable it's he's definitely got the point across it's just more of whether or not like do you find that particularly engaging does it hold your interest can you identify with the mood there's so much here ironically so much here that can either make you love or completely dispassionate towards it so mm. that i definitely that, see that that also i mean up to this point that's also just purely reading this on a sonic level as august is yeah. um i think that and i've already said this and i'll double down i think that earl is one of the best rappers um alive today one of the best and most talented uh and it may not be initially apparent his appeal i think is somewhat similar to someone like billy woods for instance or at least yes. sort of like the arm and hammer record where i talk about where the album is there's a lot happening in terms of the instrumentals and stuff and it's very easy to get lost in that and earl constructs rhymes and lines in a very elliptical way where it's like I think he raps with a little more clarity than some of those artists that we've talked about in terms of mm. it being immediately apparent what he's talking about. And also he just has a very insular approach to the things that he raps about that um, I think makes them quite easy to connect to. Um, but also he, his rhymes, his wordplay, the way that he constructs these verses is uh, incredibly intricate. Like you could teach a course on his lyricism and I, I think that the I we compare him to a lot of people, and I think the biggest comparison that a lot of people like I'm far from the first person to make this, but a one Mr. Daniel Dumoulay. I I do in fact agree that Earl is kind of like his heir apparent in many ways, and I think that like I saw a rate your music comment once that called this album sad villainy, and I'm <laughs> like, you know what, you got a point. You yeah, got a point. actually, I had not thought of Doom, but now that you say that, I mean, and even Mad Villainy, because it's like they, they, those are records that are not dissimilar in their structure, how you're just kind of like oh, yeah. moving forward through these various musical ideas. And the anchor uh, is the artist themselves. The anchor is Doom in mm -hmm. that instance, and the anchor is Earl in this instance. And I, I talked again about the just the way he performs, the way he speaks, even if you don't have the, even if you haven't had the chance to really dig into what he's saying, just the way that he enunciates. Uh, is, is and the way that he flows as well he has an urgency to the way that he raps too despite that like I see that sleepy or um, that tone where it's like he's not like particularly loud in the way that he uh, raps but he is urgent and a different it, it still comes across in an urgent way um, I think uh, Shattered Dreams throws you the opening track throws you into this world in a really immense and immediate way too uh, just the way that he is barraging forward in what he's saying um no sit up but it's crunch time shooting in the clutch the midsummer sunshine found me on my ones face dripping hate swimming through your bloodlines motherfuck the judge saying go into the one time come and take a stroll in the mud dip a toe in it heard the hammer like a grudge when you holding it close was on the cusp it was holes in the boat we ain't make a fuss just he, he just pulls you through like that and there's so much internal stuff going on within those lines alone that i could barely even um start to get into he also rides the ride of that really unconventional beat which like I, which for the record I, I of course love the beats on this album but the beat on shattered dreams especially that's sort of like really chill like dreams, bu, bu, and then you get the little guitar like boom 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 yeah dreams. it's so it's first of all it's very 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 mad lib and mm. uh but it's like it's even dirtier. It's even more uh, lo-fi. It's even more, it's it's him to like his logical extreme. And that's just the whole album, what it sounds like. You can hear some beats where like, I'm pretty sure it is on, uh, yeah, Red Water at the very beginning. You just hear this like, and it's yeah. like, dude, what the fuck is that? <laughs> yeah. Stop. That, that's one thing I really about appreciate about his production as well as how unconventional his beat construction is. Like a lot of the times the beats are quite simple. Like it's just a couple of elements. It might even mm -hmm. be a single loop, but it's really strange the things he chooses to loop. And the vocal loops he uses as well. There's one song that is kind of like that where it's just constructed from this like female wailing that's looped over and over and over again. <laughs> should he should not be able to rap over and he doesn't even really kind of like try to fit a flow onto he just kind of like earl happens on the music yeah, yeah. and it works um like one of my favorite aspects of this record for instance is the the way that it's affected for me by the context of the fact that in many ways it's heavily impacted by the death of his father yes um, 
um, who who was a poet, I believe, like a South African yeah, poet, well, and his mom is like yeah. some his mom's like a lawyer. Well, like this, he comes from like some pretty pretty tall fucking orchards here. And so this is um, you know this come becomes apparent on the track playing possum, which I think is one of the key yeah. tracks of the record, uh, in which Earl does not feature at all as a performer. Mm-hmm. Uh, it is simply samples of his parents, um, yep. his mother um, speaking of her family and including Earl in that, uh, and Earl's father himself um, reciting a poem, as you say, he is a poet. Mm-hmm. Um, and so part of this album was that Earl has had a fractious relationship with his parents. Um, famously, one of the pieces of context that informed Doris was that his mother had sent him to Samoa to a... Uh, camp for troubled kids i think to basically Mm -hmm. um because she didn't approve of what he'd been doing rapping and stuff and and his creative expressions or whatever and so that led to a fractious relationship between earl and his family earl became very close to his grandmother who passed away and who he has spoken about on well doris is named after her i believe yeah and um he speaks of her specifically on solace as well Um, and so I believe she passed (laughs) and um, and so Earl at some point uh, between 2015 and 2018 the release of this record um, decided that he wanted to atone or like at least mend fences uh, and and, and trying to repair the relationship in some way Uh, and playing possum was his way of doing that if not mending fences at least at least trying to kind of acknowledge the conflict and um so playing possum is a way that he does that and uh, i think earl specifically said that um he included in a sample of his father as a way of getting his father's attention and saying you know if you you can i dare you to send me a cease and desist and including your voice in this record right like like so there's still some fractiousness there but basically that changed or that became colored in a different light when his father died before Earl had finished the album and um, as a result of this um, the final stretch of this record specifically the last three tracks are a uh, maybe tribute isn't the right word but a kind of acknowledgement of him and uh, in, in the record in a place where Earl is as opposed to I don't like shit where Earl is focusing inward for the entirety of the record Earl uh, seems to expand outward in terms of the things that he talks about uh, towards the end of this record, the track Peanut. He raps very explicitly about um, his father's funeral, I believe, and the experience of, um, you know, coming to terms with the, uh, the consequences of his father's death. Uh, I think it's one of the most uh, heavy verses that Earl has ever dropped that I've heard him. Um, there's just some, there's a real rawness to it that I find very difficult to listen to. Uh, and then the closing piece, Riot, is an instrumental that is sampled from a South African jazz um, performer named Hugh Masikala, uh, who was a close friend of Earl's father. So it's that kind of... Um, final I guess tribute or final acknowledgement here as well so um, that's an aspect of this record that definitely uh, inf- uh, affects the when you're trying to look at this record and say okay what is Earl doing with this album what is Earl's state of mind what is Earl trying to communicate because Earl is never clear about the things he wants to communicate and that's one of the joys of him as an artist is that he makes you work to unwrap and unravel the things that he's doing and you spend time with trying to pass his verses and try and understand his state of mind and uh, that is with all great kind of abstract rappers in, in that way and so this is an aspect of Earl where the, the decision to be to foreground that aspect of Earl's life in such a direct way uh, in the tail end of this record adds this real weight to it. Yeah, I think that, um, yeah, I'm glad you mentioned uh, the death of his father because I think that also informs something about this record and that being that like the tenor here is not even like overwhelmingly dark or even depressing. I would say it's anxious. And I think that's, I mean, he does definitely talk about how he struggles with anxiety and depression both, but I think it's the anxiety that informs a lot of this album because like, 
you know, I'm not sure if it's specifically this, but Earl coming from such, you know, prodigious prospects of having your father being this like South African poet and your mother who's working to like, you know, she's like a, she's, she's like an activist at this point. So I feel like there's a lot of pressure on him. And as someone who makes art and makes music, it's sort of like, it feels like Earl is trying to prove his mettle as if he's trying to reach for something so that he can live up to maybe the expectations that maybe not even his parents had for him, but how he viewed that they looked at him. And I feel like his father dying too might inform that a little bit. And that's because like all of this album just sounding so like rickety, like it, it feels like if you touched one of the mixes on this album, it would break into a million tiny little pieces. And the, the way it flows too is just, it sort of weaves in and out from being really, really chaotic and overwhelming with all of these loops and samples. And then it'll be something that's a lot more simple. And you sort of feel him fluidly struggling to, to find himself. Like he's got that one bar on one of the earlier songs where he's just like trying to refine the shit. And it's just like, he, he, you feel like you're watching a creative struggle made form. It's, it's a very conflicted album. And I mm -hmm. feel that conflict so vividly each time I listen to it. It's, it's a very apparent. And I, I don't know, I've just never heard anything that's, quite like some rap songs and how it manages yeah. to capture that super specific tenor I, I like what you said about him yeah. kind of being more concerned about um others perceptions of him as well like, like yes. whether it is his parents whether it is him starting to reflect on his relationship with his parents and whether he needs to do something about that or whether it is his relationship with his own fame like he's famously very reclusive he speaks in the track veins specifically about um, you know, sitting on a star, thinking how I'm not a star, I want to call it off. Um, and he has these great lines about um, uh, about that feeling of, of just kind of disconnect from his stature and his status. And um, it, it, it's a really great song in that regard. And um, yeah, and so almost in a sense, you could see the brevity of this album as almost being a reflection of Earl's own hesitance to embrace his role like, or his, his place in the culture or his hesitance to deliver on the expectations that have been, um, you know, placed upon him to create masterpieces that, that would even track with the fact that the follow up to this was an EP that was even shorter than this is and he's been silent ever since then. Yeah. So he, he almost seems to be regressing inward in a way that I find very artistically interesting, if concerning. Um, and yeah, and it, it certainly does present a work that is, um, you know, beholden to the limits of that depending on how you feel yeah. about it yeah um in in terms of lyricism i think uh that that kind of man versus self concept at the at the center of it i i think also it it needs to be spoken for just how like how truly unique that feels in the way he approaches it in hip-hop where I, I really particularly love his metaphors to express his depression and like battle against himself of sorts. Uh, one that really jumps out to me is the uh, repeated use of a like food or, or dinner motif and metaphor throughout this where he's speaking about his, his fullness, so to speak, and What's interesting, I think, is that the record ends with the last time he mentions this idea, he mentions being not full and unfulfilled, where previously, earlier in the record, he had mentioned that fullness. And I think that's, and that obviously ties a bit into the meta aspects of the record with his father's death and all. And I think it just, ties together in a really fascinating way in that sense of of the way he presents depression as never being like you're never like over it you're just you just beat it for a time and that's a really painful mature sentiment to have to compartmentalize and deal with mm. and I think he does it brilliantly so even if I may not be crazy about this structurally, I think as a writer, he's definitely very fascinating.
yeah oh, yeah totally th there's almost like a push and pull in the writing of this record between two states for earl where one state is a kind of yeah a resentment of his father for leaving the family and for ignoring him and basically putting him in a position where he uh you know is in this kind of loose unfixed state uh he's it, it alludes to this specifically on multiple tracks it's not even just at the end of the record that he alludes to his father it, his father kind of hangs over this entire record he alludes to him in many tracks red water for instance mm -hmm. um but there's so there's that there's that sense of resentment that's se seething inside of earl um and there's also the sense of conflict between that resentment and an, a sense of self-loathing and a sense of, of worthlessness that Earl experiences as well as a result of his drug addiction, which he also talks about on this record a lot as well. Um, one of my favorite tracks on the record is Ezuka, which is this kind of like, again, it has the verse in this track has this stream of consciousness feel where it feels like Earl is just like rambling from line to line to line. And it's not until you kind of sit down and read it that you realize he's really just kind of pieced these lines together so that there's very consistent rhyme schemes and, and re references and stuff. And then that's actually this one pick it's almost like a puzzle that fits together but as an experience it feels like it's loose and formless and you're moving through it and then onto the next track but he speaks in this song about pedal to the middle lost footing it was sugar in my gas tank my cushion was a bosom on bad days it's not a black woman i can't thank you called crying when i told you the, these the last days it's all mine i could have split the last plate fellas didn't have faith so i stopped trying apologize and we out of time please get your alibi straight you ain't got a lie shook tradition did it my way no sense in looking in the sky trace elements metal with mines mine state live fissures and fires fellas with live ammunitions on in the stick on the highway i only get better with time that's what my mum say to dodge satan to say say to kill him this time oy vey well here i go foot on the line what's mine what's good is if it's not you shook a bit sooky sooky fellas wasn't shit I face looking like I stumbled out of a pit, $100 chip. I piss problems out, the bottle empty. Mama said she used to see my father in me, said I was not offended. Priest, King, Navy, me and Mike on the bench. Living life like a fella put a price on my head. Bless this, how we on it. If you need it and I want it, better come prepared. Going through it like prayers in the night sky. You look like a chair when you're folding up. Head on the goalie with the puck. Don't need any luck. See the ghost of where I was, lonesome as I was white boys got bars <laughs> yeah oh so goodness. yeah so there's so many uh, different fella uh, yeah. don't even need yeah. to listen to the album now <laughs> there's so many different emotions and feelings that earl is kind of flying through and that stream of consciousness verse from that self-loathing to that resentment to that uh sense of disappointment from of his mother and 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 how he's trying to reconcile these emotions where he feels this resentment towards his father and, and distance from the people who love him. Uh, and this sense that actually maybe I'm really responsible for this because I'm a fuck up and I've done these things to myself and I let myself fall into the state. And it's difficult to listen to. Like it's really difficult to listen to once you start paying attention to what he's saying because it is very, you know, emotionally just fucked up. And, but that I think is, is, one of the joys of the record that Earl is able to communicate all of that while still feeling like he's holding it together as a writer. Um, yeah. <laughs> I think to put a bit of punctuation on this is that I kind of had an epiphany listening to it is that I was just always like, I've always been enraptured and fascinated by it. And I've obviously grown to love it even more over the years, but I was just like, I just don't really know why. And I think that sort of, at least in the way that we talk about it, is that I think the word deconstruction is kind of a dirty word, uh, at least among us, just because like, it's always indicative of something that we kind of feel isn't that. And so it brings to question, what even is a deconstruction? And how do you know what it is when you see it and how it's done? like properly. And I think a lot of the time, like August and I had a really fun time uh, hmm, talking about a, a movie we saw that we both were just like, this is the artistic intent of this is to be a deconstruction. Oh, and the yeah. problem with it is that it only existed as that. And so in the sense when, while watching it, it's just like, okay, but like, you're not anything else. So I don't get anything out of this. And I think the regression that we speak of that Earl kind of focuses and hones in on that eventually led to some rap songs is maybe not consciously, but sort of an attempt to deconstruct 
how somebody would even listen to hip hop because the way I've always like listened to this album and picked it apart, it's always because it has that formless structure that it has that unconventional delivery and route of production and runtime. Like I'll defend the album's runtime as being like, if I, if this album was any longer than it was, I just think it would be too much of what it is. It would feel too fucking, well, I mean, it would make me too fucking anxious. I feel like it's just perfectly sized to be what it is. And you know, that's, you know, again, my mileage may vary, but in a conscious attempt to sort of strip everything away and to become super stream of consciousness, if you want to engage with this album, you really do have to look into what he's doing that is different about normal hip hop. You have to really look into the lyrics. You have to really notice the production. And otherwise, it might just not hit you that same way. But you listen to it and it sort of feels like there is a conscious attempt to be raw, to be completely unfiltered. And to still engage in this avenue of music, but simultaneously holding a bit of a black mirror to it. Like some rap songs, even in the title, some rap songs, it's like, what an innocuous fucking title. It, it's just like a collection. It feels to me like there's a, a definitely at least a conscious attempt at some kind of subversion here. And the reason that this works and where other works of art don't, at least largely don't, at least lots that are seen as one, is that it's not only a deconstruction. It's obviously a, it's, it's a time capsule for how Earl feels and his emotional volatility and all of these things that led him here. And he's using a deconstruction as an avenue to do that. And it's not that it's just one or the other, it's that it's both. And that's what makes it special, at least to me anyway. Beautifully said. Word. Okay, well, that's a good place to wrap up, I suppose. Um, wrap up. <gasps> Funny. <gasps> All right, favorite tips and ratings are um, Jake, why don't you go first? Uh, difficult to pick just because this is a short album and I listen to every song. I don't listen to individual songs from this, so it's kind of hard to pick and choose from the things, but I have listened to it a lot. So I will say I, I really do love the intro. I love Shattered Dreams a lot because of that beat and that delivery. I also really love the song Veins just because those are some of the most intense bars that are on here. Uh, and I really, really like um, uh, uh, December 24th. There's a really good story being told on that track that I think is really vital to understanding what's going on in the album. Um, and honestly, it I, I really don't have a least favorite track on here just because I wouldn't change anything about the album. It just feels like it is perfectly itself. I don't really enjoy anything any less. So yeah, and this is a, this is a 10 for me. Mm -mm. Hell yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Good one. Thank you. So for me, I, I'd say. Oh, there. That's upset. Favorites oh, are. Uh, I'd say Red Water, Nowhere to Go, and The Mint are my favorites. My least favorite, I guess, would be like. Uh, Perhaps, uh, like, I guess Lucy, kind of a track I don't have too many distinct thoughts about, but uh, as a whole, I would, uh, I would give this a six myself, which is not to say I don't enjoy it. I just, I wish I enjoyed it more, wish I got into it, it more. It, it's kind of an album that's designed to not give a fuck about people. So yeah. I, like, I, I definitely know that like, it's not even like, a, oh, I just wish I enjoyed this because it sounds like something I would like, but it's, it's just such an unfriendly album. So yeah. I don't think that like, and you know. It, it should be noted. I, it should be noted. This is not my first brush with this album. I had heard this a couple times. I want to say like two years ago at this point, and I, I felt similarly back then to how I do now. I just feel now I'm all, I'm better at talking about how I feel. So, <laughs> fair uh, enough. That's... Hey, good to refine your thoughts. Got to refine this shit. Yeah. Uh, my, my three favorite tracks are, as as you car, veins. And nowhere to go. 
sequel to the nowhere and the go to nowhere to sure. go sure uh appreciate not really it, i don't really have a least favorite i mean it's all it, it's all so of a whole that yeah can't really poke a poke a hole in it I'm it's so like how solace is a 10 minute ep it's just one track uh yeah, I'll give this uh six and a half. All right, Tyler. Um, I'm actually gonna not pick favorite tracks because thinking on what Jake said, it it just doesn't. I can't really do that. <laughs> like, yeah, it's hard. It just it's not really how I experience this record. No. Um, I'm gonna give it an eight out of ten. All right, that gives Search, us. I believe an... gives it a nine. All right, last I well, checked, gives us a seven point nine out of ten, which is which equivalent in the company oh, with of Arm and Hammer Alchemist. How fitting! Perfect. Yeah, and uh, some other uh, assorted. Also, De La Soul is dead. Yeah. Uh, but, between the Barrett and Me Colors, uh, Deftone Saturday Night Wrist, just to name <laughs> a few. All right. That's good company. Beautiful. Okay, well, uh, next week's Record Club episode is going to be on August Record Club recommendation, which is? Uh, it is the album uh, Hissing Prigs and Static Couture by the band, by legendary uh, Dayton, Ohio, uh, Post hardcore question mark band Brainiac. Uh, this is a band who had a huge influence on A, the Mars Volta and at the drive in, along with the, I, I'd say, the entirety of the post hardcore scene in the rest of the 90s, whose front man's life was tragically cut short shortly after the release of this album. So, oh dear. I figure it's uh, it's a, going to be an interesting one to talk about, and also because I don't see it getting a terrible amount of coverage online. So that is my yes, most hardcore. I'm in. Yes. So uh, stick around for that. Uh, check out our new release reviews this week. We reviewed Danny Elfman's new album, Big Mess, and we reviewed Panopticon's new album, And Again Into the Light. But let us know what you think of Earl Sweet Shirt's album, some rap songs in the comments <laughs> below. Um, do you like it? Do you hate it? Did we miss anything about the album? Obviously, there's a lot going on with what Earl's talking about, so there may have been something that we didn't get to talk about, so let us know in the comments below if we did. And, yeah. Rock over London. Rock on Chicago. Subaru. Confidence in motion.